Good afternoon, everyone, uh, or good morning if you're in, in Europe, and uh, welcome to this very special webinar uh, on addressing sustainability-related uh, risks during the, the COVID uh, pandemic uh, and focusing on the role of uh, central banks and monetary authorities. Um, as you will no doubt be aware, we are joined by a very esteemed group of presenters and panelists to discuss this, um, and uh, hopefully we'll have a very fruitful discussion and we want to encourage you to also join in uh, and, and uh, jo uh, you know, send, send us your comments and also be a part of the discussion when we go to that part of it. Um, I want to introduce myself first of all. I'm Aziz Durrani. I'm a senior financial uh, sector specialist at the CSUN Center. And the CSUN Center is a nonprofit organization. It's owned by 19 central banks across Asia. Uh, and we've been very active in the sustainability debate and uh, helping the central banks to uh, work through the various policies and, and issues that will be required as, as, uh, as we go through uh, this, this pandemic. And of course, it's particularly relevant to Asia because we've been feeling a lot of the um, immediate impacts of, of various uh, climate related issues and risks. And of course, like most countries in the world, uh, the, the recession that's hitting us now is, is, is always also going to be very difficult to deal with. And of course, that brings a key challenge because, uh, of course, a lot of the uh, fossil fuel based industries create jobs and employment. And so there's going to be natural conflict between managing those and at the same time, uh, encouraging growth and, and newer sustainability uh, infrastructures. And I think a key part of the, the debate should therefore be of how we can encourage new growth in, in those uh, green industries to, to take over some of the, of the job losses and so on. But anyway, that's, that's uh, enough of an introduction. I think it's, it's time to get on to our main uh, and first presentation for today. Um, I'm very pleased to introduce Dr. Marjun, who's the director of the Research Center um, uh, for Green Finance Development at Tsinghua University. And he's also chair of the NGFS Research Workstream. So uh, Dr. Ma, please, please uh, take it away. Thank you very much, Aziz. Can you hear me okay? Yes, indeed we can. Great. Uh, thanks again. And uh, on behalf of NGFS, I'd like to welcome all of you for attending this uh, important seminar on uh, environmental and climate risks. Um, as you probably know, the NGFS was uh, set up uh, back two years ago, initially by eight central banks, uh, including some of those in uh, Europe, uh, in UK and China and others. And now this network has expanded to uh, a platform of more than 70 members, uh, including the central banks and supervisors. And also we have uh, many other international organizations joining as observers. So it's becoming a very, very important platform for global coordination uh, in terms of designing and promoting uh, green finance related policy initiatives. Um, recently, the NGFS uh, um, launched a set of publications on environmental risk analysis. Um, these publications were supervised by the uh, supervision work stream, which I chaired in the past two years until September this year. Uh, so I am pleased to have the opportunity to present these publications to uh, this webinar uh, with a view of promoting the adoption among financial institutions on ERA or environmental risk analysis. Now, just give me one second and I'm trying to uh, upload my, my PowerPoint. Aziz, can you hear me and uh, see the slide? Yep, yep, it's all good. Uh, the presentation is on the NGFS publications. There are actually two publications which we put out uh, in September this year. One is called Environmental Risk Analysis Overview, and uh, the other one is called Occasional Paper, which is a much, much longer document, 600 pages, uh, with uh, uh, detailed methodologies on how to conduct such analysis. And uh, as I said, I was the chair of a supervision work stream. Um, which was also called Workstream 1 under NGFS that produced these two documents. And now I uh, am the uh, research Workstream head, uh, which is in charge of promotion or dissemination 
of um, products coming out of NGFS. And uh, the first set of products are the ERA uh, publications. So my role is switching, but I'm working on the same subject. Um, I will cover the uh, overview, uh, which is official view of the NGFS on how to conduct environmental risk analysis and how to promote uh, such methodologies. And then the occasional paper, which is a set of case studies that involve more than 30 organizations um, usage of their methodologies. And finally, uh, we'll be opening up for some Q&A. Now, in terms of background, as you probably noticed that uh, uh, back in 2019, the NGFS uh, was uh, already uh, publishing something uh, saying that uh, climate change is a source of financial risk. Uh, this is the first time a group of central banks and supervisors stating that, uh, which clearly shows that this is a growing consensus among policymakers. And obviously, uh, with this being a risk, you need to analyze the risk. And the risk uh, would involve identification of the source of the risks, measure the exposure to such risks, and quantify the consequences of such risks in terms of impact on financial assets. Um, the problem is that uh, in most places in the world, the financial sector, including banks, asset managers, insurance company, are not fully aware of such environmental and climate risks. And uh, therefore, uh, they could uh, excessively invest in polluting and high carbon assets because of unawareness and uh, thereby exacerbating environmental degradation and climate change. At the same time, by investing in such uh, brown assets, they pose challenges to financial stability because as I will show you later on, uh, such exposures could lead to significant decrease in valuation of the assets and could lead to a very significant increase in non-performing loan ratio of uh, the loans or the bonds that they hold. And, uh, and with that uh, recognition, the NGFS began to uh, organize our members, which are central banks and supervisors, and also external experts, starting from late 2019, and we began to draft uh, publications on environmental risk analysis. Now here, just a, a a uh, small footnote on terminology. By environmental risk analysis, we include both uh, pure environmental uh, related risk analysis, for example, air pollution, water pollution, uh, land contamination, but also include, importantly, climate risk analysis. And this term of ERA uh, is just a short um, form of climate and environmental risk analysis. The view of this publication is to promote the adoption of such methodologies in the uh, financial community, uh, especially among banks, asset managers, and insurance companies. Now, starting with the overview, uh, which looks like this on the left-hand side of this uh, uh, slide, uh, it's a publication uh, from the NGFS. So it represents official view of the NGFS. And uh, uh, this, overview provides a non-technical review of the tools and methodologies which cover a wide range of scenario analysis and stress testing. And these are what we call forward-looking analysis because they don't show you what happened in the past, but will show you what may happen in the future. Um, and it could be one year, three year, five year, or even 20, 30 years um, uh, forward-looking analysis. And we looked at both transition and fiscal risks uh, I assume all of you understand the uh, difference between these risks, uh, but in case not, physical risks would uh, involve examples such as sea level increase, um, the increasing intensity of natural disasters as a result of climate change, and the uh, transition risks uh, would typically involve energy-related transition. Uh, for example, by energy transition policies, uh, you will see decline in demand for uh, fossil fuel um, uh, energy and related products and increasing demand for renewable energy. And such transition of demand, supply, and pricing will lead to uh, upside and downside risks to certain industries uh, related to energy or related to carbon. So these are the type of risks which we cover using scenario analysis and stress testing. Of course, the uh, report also covers some what we call more static analysis uh, using uh, backward looking information and uh, taking the form of ESG carbon footprint accounting and natural capital risk analysis. Of course, some of these are including uh, forward-looking elements as well. And after reviewing the uh, methodologies, um, 
we also identified a couple of barriers to wider adoption of such methodology in the financial institutions. Um, and uh, against these barriers, we proposed a couple of options to promote wider adoption of the uh, ERA. Here I'm listing the couple of barriers. I think these are important for uh, central banks and the supervisors to understand. And therefore, um, based on your local conditions, may adopt a certain uh, actions and some of which could be you know, out of the uh, option list that we provide in the report. One of the barrier is the lack of awareness. Um, as we understand in many countries, especially developing countries, the awareness of environmental climate risks are still quite low. Uh, not many senior managers of bank insurance companies and the asset managers are uh, aware that uh, the exposure to environmental risks uh, and climate risks could lead to financial um, risks. And uh, uh, the second problem is uh, the lack of data, uh, whether it's environmental data or data that's linking environmental risks, such as exposure to high carbon assets to the financial losses. And uh, limited capacity to develop internal um, methodologies. And a lot of uh, banks, as a manager, uh, because of size is relatively limited, they are not in the position to invest millions of dollars to developing such methodologies internally. So they need external help. And uh, uh, especially in emerging markets, I think uh, uh, application uh, is, is more limited. In the process of compiling these documents, um, we feel that uh, uh, more than 80% of these methodologies uh, that's developed or used are in, uh, are in OECD countries. Emerging markets are still uh, very, very limited in terms of development and adoption of methodologies. And uh, finally, the methodologies themselves and the data that's used by existing methodologies are still having problems, uh, whether in terms of accuracy, in terms of completeness, in terms of user friendliness, uh, there are still a lot of issues that need to be addressed. Against these barriers, we uh, developed a couple of options. Uh, for example, enhancing awareness of the need for ERA. How do we do that? We have a fuller discussion in the text. One of the uh, options under uh, this heading is that the central banks and uh, the banking regulator themselves should conduct environmental risk analysis and assess the system risk um, arising from the banking or uh, other financial sectors exposure to climate and uh, environmental risks, so that uh, uh, raising uh, the awareness uh, of uh, those institutions they supervise. And secondly, some public goods need to be developed, uh, namely uh, government or supervisor hosted capacity building uh, for developing methodologies and developing databases, some of which could be shared uh, within the industry. And, uh, also, we think uh, uh, some organizations, maybe government, maybe industry association, maybe MDBs, should support or sponsor some demonstration projects so that they can look at uh, some typical cases, uh, for example, co-related uh, climate risks. And once such methodology are developed, they can be shared um, and uh, are disseminated to uh, the rest of the uh, financial community for adoption at a much, much lower cost. And also disclosure is important. Uh, we feel that if the financial institutions are not required to disclose environmental climate risk exposure and not required to disclose ERE analysis results, they may not have full incentive to do that. So some efforts to move from uh, voluntary to semi-compulsory and eventually to compulsory requirement for disclosure may be needed. And also developing key risk indicators are important. Uh, and uh, so far, the methodologies developed by more than 30 organizations are all different, and they use very different risk indicators. The comparability of such risks are very poor, and we need to work towards some harmonized set of uh, risk indicators to measure uh, environmental climate risks. And uh, uh, finally, we need some taxonomies to define what is green, what is brown, and so far, there's no universally recognized uh, green and brown taxonomies, which also pose challenge on the comparability of the results, uh, whether it's about risk exposure or about the uh, uh, financial risk arising from risk exposures. Um, now, moving on to the occasional paper, which, as I said, is a much more detailed uh, report on methodology. 
That's not called a NGFS official report. Uh, it's called occasional paper modeled after the uh, IMF occasional paper. And the uh, uh, occasional paper are uh, viewed as views of the authors rather than the NGFS. Uh, that's why uh, we have more flexibility of including academics, including financial institutions and third party vendors uh, products into uh, this report. This is the uh, table content of the occasional paper. Uh, you can see it has 37 chapters written by more than 30 organizations. And we break them down into ERA for banks, ERA for institutional investors and insurers. And uh, uh, also uh, we looked at other methodologies than uh, forward looking uh, methodologies such as stress testing and scenario analysis. And finally, we discussed a couple of cross cutting issues uh, which include data issue, assumption issue, and the methodology issue, and so on and so forth. So I think uh, this is uh, so far the most complete um, collection of methodology in the space of ERA. Now, let me give you just a couple of examples that are contained in the uh, occasional paper. Here is one chapter uh, which myself and Dr. Sun uh, has written using the uh, uh, Chinese uh, uh, Co-fi power generation sector as a case study to look at the transition risks of uh, banks lending to this particular sector. So the exact question is that uh, what uh, if a bank continues to lend to Co-fi power generation sector, what's going to happen to the non-performing loan ratio in the coming 10 years? And uh, we use this set of model, uh, which involve uh, four different modules initially setting the climate scenario, for example, um, you know, base case scenario and uh, two degree scenario. And uh, under different scenarios, the different assumptions on transition policies. And with such a transition policies, uh, we'll measure the impact on some macro and uh, sectorial um, uh, variables, such as demand, supply, and pricing of energy uh, related uh, sectors. And then we put in these uh, uh, sector related uh, 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 results into the financial models of the companies. We looked at three representative Chinese Kofi power generator, and uh, uh, we're putting this uh, uh, financial impact data into the company financial model and ended up with a whole bunch of new financial ratios in the coming 10 years. And these financial ratios then uh, is uh, uh, used to estimate the PD uh, property of default um, of these companies in the coming 10 years. And we end up with the, the uh, uh, default probability uh, number um, using uh, different scenarios um, uh, or under different scenarios. And finally, we make a comparison to show that uh, from scenario one to scenario two, how much the increase of non-performing loan ratio or probability de uh, default increase in the coming 10 years. Now, the exact uh, Questions we ask in terms of transition are the following. Uh, what if we have the five shocks? Number one, the demand for coal fired power generation is going to go down due to energy transition, which means that the, the revenue for coal fired power generator will go down. And secondly, because of the uh, technology progress, renewable energy sectors such as solar and wind will see their cost going down uh, significantly in the coming 10 years, and therefore putting downward pressure on thermal power companies pricing power. Uh, therefore, their pricing of the uh, coal-fired power generator will also go down as a result. And thirdly, carbon pricing will likely to go up in the coming 10 years. According to World Bank forecast, carbon prices will have to go up by 10 times if China is to need the uh, 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 Paris Agreement, which is the carbon neutrality target that Chinese president has recently announced. And with carbon price going up by 10 times, the uh, coal-fired power generator, if they are not aggressively reducing carbon, they will have to pay much higher price for buying such carbon quota. Uh, that's a cost increase. And finally, uh, because of the uh, deterioration in financial ratios, due to the first three reasons, the funding cost of these company will go up as the banks or bond market will begin to downgrade their credit rating. And finally, some of the Chinese banks are considering increasing risk weights for brown assets, which may include coal-fired power generation. As a result of this policy change, 
they may also see increase in funding cost. So these are the five shocks which we designed to describe the energy transition. And uh, by putting these shocks uh, into the suite of model, we end up with these charts for the three representative Chinese coal-fired power generation company. All of them will see significant increase in default probability in the coming 10 years. And uh, in one case, um, which is the average of the three company, we show that their default probability will go up from 3% today to 22% by 2030. Note, this default probability is about one year default probability. It's not cumulative yet. So very obvious, uh, there's a huge risk of continuing your investment in coal-fired power generation sector or continuing your lending to that sector. And knowing that um, it's gonna significantly change the, uh, um, the composition of the uh, investment portfolio or lending portfolio of the bank. Um, comparing with not knowing the risk, I think the uh, environmental risk analysis can significantly change the portfolio of financial institutions, including banks and investors, towards uh, greener and uh, reducing their exposure to brown and therefore saving themselves from uh, engaging in very risky operations. Now, I'll give you a couple of other examples contained in the occasional paper. Uh, I don't have time to to, to elaborate, um, so I'll be, be very quick. Uh, this is a case study uh, called the climate value at risk uh, <clears throat> using large European banks as uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the data sources. And they looked at the uh, low carbon and high carbon uh, investment strategies. And they showed that the value risk um, of high carbon exposure are very, very high. And uh, here's a case study uh, from another chapter of our uh, occasional paper done by Vivi Economics, which shows that uh, out of the uh, sectors on the uh, listed market, um, the energy sector may see something like 40% drop in valuation. And uh, um, uh, obviously, uh, because it's involving a lot of uh, high carbon uh, energy sources such as uh, coal and oil. This is another case study done by two degree investment initiative, which shows that uh, the probability of default of bonds uh, issued by coal related sector is going to go up by about four times. And uh, uh, there are many case studies uh, in the physical risk space as well. Uh, so far, I've been talking about mainly transition risks and the physical risks would involve typically these uh, modules, uh, starting with stochastic uh, event uh, to hazard module to vulnerability module, and finally assessing the impact on financial losses. And a case study by CISO uh, shows uh, the impact of physical risk on insurance sector, uh, <clears throat> where they produced a lot of numbers on the percentage increase of uh, insurance losses. <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> this is another case study uh, which can decompose the source of financial losses uh, from um, different aspects, I guess, so macroeconomic impact at production level and due to extreme weather or business interruption um, and so on and so forth. There are other approach uh, other than stress testing or scenario analysis, which we saw before. Uh, these include the uh, yeah, uh, ESG scoring methodology, um, uh, water risk, uh, uh, credit risk tools and uh, natural capital credit risk assessment and also air pollution related uh, stress testing uh, all done by different organizations. So that's all I'd like to highlight uh, um, for this presentation and uh, at least if we have time uh, we'd love to you know answer a couple of questions from here. Yeah 
Thank you very much, uh, uh, Marjan. Um, we, we, we will come to the questions and the, and the kind of panel session uh, just a bit later. Um, but thank you very much for, for um, a, a very uh, enlightening presentation that, that kind of, uh, you know, lets us know exactly where the NGFS is and, and some of the work being, being done uh, on the back of the COVID crisis. Now, of course, uh, as, as you may be aware, this webinar itself uh, forms part of the Sustainable Crisis uh, Response Project, uh, which is being funded by Inspire. Um, and it's being led by a research uh, partnership made up of E3G, uh, the SOAS Center for Sustainable Finance, uh, CSUN, and uh, the Bennett Institute for Public Policy at the University of Cambridge. And the idea is that we've been uh, holding events such as this and undertaking research to, to, to hear the views of different speakers and experts in the area. Uh, and then we're putting together uh, uh, some policy briefs to help guide central banks and monetary authorities in Asia and also globally um, to uh, you know, ascertain what are the what are the next best steps of actions that should be taken in in 2021 and beyond to to both deal with COVID and ensure we get a a, a sustainable um, development coming coming through that. So um, that then brings us to our next presentation, um, and um, it, it's 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 on a, on a toolbox that has been developed on sustainable crisis crisis response measures for central banks and supervisors. Uh, and, and the presentation of some lessons from practice, so very pertinent to this topic. Um, and I'd like to introduce the speakers who, along with uh, Ulrich Volt, who you'll hear from a bit later, have, have helped uh, put this together. So can I uh, introduce Simon Decau, who's a research officer at the Grantham Research Institute on Climate Change and the Environment at the London School of Economics and Political Science, and Nick Robbins, Professor of Practice in Sustainable Finance, uh, also at the Grantham Research Institute on Climate Change and the Environment at the LSE. So Simon and Nick, please join us. Well, thank you so much, uh, Aziz, and great to join you. Really fantastic to follow yourself, uh, Dr. Mar, and your presentation of the ERA, ERA handbook. I mean, a great treasure trove of, of uh, insights there. Um, so delighted to be part of this um, uh, this, this workshop. So first a little bit about uh, INSPIRE. It uh, stands for the International Network of Sustainable Finance Policy, Insights, Research and Exchange. And it's been set up um, with a specific purpose of channeling sort of best uh, ideas and, and, and rigorous research from the academic and analytical community around the world uh, to, uh, to support the work of the, the NGFS, um, which uh, Dr. Ma outlined. We are a research stakeholder of the NGFS. I'm delighted to be the co-chair of, uh, of, of INSPIRE, along with Ilmi Granhoff, who uh, works at the Climate Works Foundation, heads sustainable finance there. We have the relationship with NGFS. We have an advisory uh, committee um, with uh, Dr. Professor Wang Yao in, in, in Beijing, um, uh, Pierre Monin from CEP in Switzerland, and Jacob Termo from Two Degrees uh, Initiative in, in Berlin. And what do we do? Um, we commission research. Um, on a variety of topics that are relevant uh, for NGFS, for central banks and supervisors. We conve convene uh, researchers, policymakers and practitioners, and we aim to communicate, which is what we're doing, doing today. So next slide, please. So in terms of our, I suppose, two research uh, modalities, um, we have been commissioning research. We, do, we have been doing this through an open process. We've had four calls for proposals and have now commissioned over 30 uh, pieces of research from a whole variety of different topics. And then also we've been working with NGFS through uh, Inspire to support uh, the uh, ERA occasional paper, which Dr. Ma has just presented, and also to provide uh, support for the reference scenarios which NGFS has been uh, developing on, on climate change and doing that together with uh, Bloomberg. Just to give you a sense of the range of uh, themes that our research is looking at. So we're looking at microprudential, number one, uh, macroprudential, looking at risk differentials and taxonomies, monetary policy, that was the subject of our most recent uh, call. Uh, we're looking at sovereign bonds, obviously a key asset uh, for central banks. We're looking at the effect and the impact of green policies in the real economy. And then the one in the middle, theme six, is sustainable crisis response. How is this terrible uh, health uh, crisis, this economic shock of uh, COVID 
how is that uh, impacting the way in which central banks and supervisors are um, trying to support the greening of the financial system? And that's the, the theme of our toolbox, which um, we'll present to you right now. Next slide, please. So here, here's the, the cover of the toolbox. It's the second edition. Um, and as we know, in this crisis, it's a very dynamic um, uh, crisis. It's going through many stages. This was initially conceived in, in March as the crisis really took hold. Uh, and we were really trying to ask the question, how is it that uh, central banks, as they respond in a whole variety of measures to support the financial system and economies through this uh, economic shock, um, how can they connect this with the rising ambition and commitment to deal with uh, environmental risks, climate risks, and also support the green financial system. So, so this, this is the, the second edition, first edition in June, uh, and this is a work in progress, so still very dynamic. Thank you. Next slide. So um, in, in terms of the need to act swiftly right now, clearly uh, we've seen extraordinary me measures in terms of uh, the nature and scale, uh, liquidity in the trillions uh, by central banks, and, and that has really been essential to support economies in the face of this uh, un unprecedented shock in the, in the last hundred years. Clearly, at the same time, these organizations have been deepening their commitment to taking action to confront climate change and other environmental uh, risks. Um, and as I say, we, we released our first edition uh, of uh, what we call our Sustainable Crisis Response uh, Toolbox, setting out central banks, how they could join the dots between the two. And that really set out the architecture, the, the main themes of the uh, toolbox. And in this second edition, what we've done is look at actually what is happening, what is going on. We've expanded our empirical assessment um, and looked at what actually has is, is being, um, being carried out by central banks and supervisors. Um, and, and how are they incorporating climate and environment factors and how could that improve in the future? Thank you. So it says why, why when we're thinking about this immediate uh, crisis, should central banks and supervisors be thinking about uh, climate change? Uh, isn't this a sort of a distant issue and, and really something that they should put to one side and really focus on the, the immediate crisis. We think that actually it is essential for central banks and supervisors to be thinking about uh, climate change and wider environmental risks at this moment. Um, firstly, what we found very striking is this year in 2020, the shock caused by COVID-19 has really served to deepen rather than deflect the strategic case for central banks and supervisors to integrate long-term risks into their uh, operations. I think uh, particularly the fact that COVID-19 is a zoonotic disease, it comes from the animal uh, kingdom, um, and it has shown the fragility of human systems, economic systems, financial systems, to environmentally, environmentally based shocks. And we know that zoonotic based uh, pandemics are actually exacerbated by environmental practices such as deforestation, uh, biodiversity loss and climate change. So I think in a sense, it has been um, the mother of all stress tests and in very, and which has roots uh, in uh, environmental degradation. So I think it's been very profound in that sense as, as, as making clear that uh, these environmental risks are not distant threats, but actually are here and actually can have systemic and profoundly damaging uh, implications. Building on that, what we've also seen, sorry, Simon, if you can just go one, the final one, sorry, thank you, um, is that actually the shock that we've seen has actually accelerated many, many, many trends. And some of these transition risks, which Dr. Ma were talking earlier, for example, uh, in terms of oil demand, clearly hit very badly by the closure of most transport uh, networks. Um, and this has brought forward uh, the peak in global oil demand by many years from the late 2020s. And 2019 is now recognized by many as being the, the likely peak in global oil demand. And, and so in a sense, it's acted as a accelerator of some of the transition risks. Thank you. Next slide. So um, why particularly uh, as central banks are thinking about um, responding to the crisis using a whole range of tools, uh, monetary tools, prudential tools and other tools, 
Um, what are the, um, the, the sort of the, the, the key reasons for thinking about um, climate factors and other environmental factors? First is to think about their own balance sheets and to make sure that climate risks and other risks are properly reflected in their own balance sheets. Um, particularly, as we know, we have pervasive market failures, so we cannot expect that the prices of assets in the market are actually reflecting a full extent of environmental risk. That's the first reason. Think about your own balance sheets. The second, actually, obviously, is to think about um, the climate-related risks in the uh, financial institutions that are supervised um, by central banks uh, and regulatory authorities, and to make sure that as, as you make uh, an intervention to deal with the crisis, that these micro risks are dealt with. Then, clearly, there is the importance of ensuring that uh, crisis response measures do not lead to um, an increase in actually climate-related risks across uh, the financial system. I think it concerns that some of the uh, initial responses on the fiscal side, not so much on the central bank side, but on the fiscal side, um, have actually supported um, fossil fuel based economies, exactly the sort of sectors that we actually need to see uh, being uh, moved into transition and phasing, phasing out. And finally, obviously, uh, central banks and supervisors um, have um, links, strong links uh, to policy um, uh, agencies and governments. Um, and uh, these governments are now very clearly saying they want to see a green recovery from COVID-19, uh, which is in line with the Paris Agreement and the Sustainable Development Goals. And central banks and supervisors have a role in actually supporting governments to achieve this uh, green recovery. So this is my, my last slide, then I'm going to hand over to my colleague, uh, Dr. Simon Dickow, who will go into the details. This really gives you a sense of the key features of the toolbox. Uh, what we did with this uh, was uh, look at the, the range of different mechanisms that actually were being used by um, central banks uh, and supervisors. Um, and we did this in, in sort of two, two steps. Firstly, saying, what is the range of tools that are used from a conventional perspective, and we could call that often, it is often sustainability blind. And how can these tools be calibrated to respond to the crisis? So that's the sort of first step, step, step A. And then second is how could those same tools be sustainability enhanced through uh, incorporating climate and other, other factors? So that was what we did. So really looking across the spectrum of, of crisis response measures, and then looking at the sort of plain vanilla version, and then looking at a green version. And on the, on the left, you can see the range of tools at a very high level, um, the nine tools in three categories that we have identified. So firstly, monetary policy, so uh, ways in which collateral frameworks have been deployed, uh, looking at indirect uh, monetary policy instruments, uh, non-standard instruments, and then direct monetary policy instruments. And then there's prudential policy, uh, both regulation of supervision, both at the uh, micro and the macro prudential scales. And then there are a range of other policies. One, uh, other financing schemes, then the, the way in which central bank portfolios are being managed, and finally, supporting sustainable finance, which is a sort of a new area. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, we've seen a rise in commitment by central banks and supervisors uh, alongside uh, crisis response. I'm now going to hand over to you, Simon, uh, to really go into the detail of what we found and our recommendations. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Nick. Um, so I will I will very briefly discuss what we found in practice and then outline um, our ideas for what the next next steps could be. So how sustainable is the current crisis response in in practice? We have we have investigated this. Um, uh, well, well, we have investigated the policy response of central banks and supervisors in 188 economies. And our investigation is based on the IMF's response to COVID-19 uh, policy tracker. And our key findings are, well, almost all instruments that are included in the toolbox are currently being used as a crisis response measure. Um, by central banks and supervisors, although, and this is the crucial point here, not in a sustainability enhanced calibration. And generally, we have observed that central banks have moved very quickly to extend their collateral frameworks to include a broader variety and quality of assets. So this is something we found almost everywhere. Um, and then many central banks and supervisors have eased counter-cyclical capital buffers and general microprudential regulation and supervisory standards. Again, something that we found in, in, in many countries. 
um, yes, this figure provides an overview of the relative use of these nine different instruments of the toolbox. And as you can see, the, um, with the exception of changes in, in central bank portfolio management practices, which is our category eight here, instruments in all categories have been, have been widely used. And unsurprisingly, of course, the, um, the adjustment of indirect monetary policy instruments, which is category two here, uh, is, used, is used in 48% uh, percent of, of the countries and is therefore the dominating crisis response instrument. And this is followed, as, as mentioned on the last slide, by um, um, a change in microprudential instruments, which is category five here in 40% of the countries. And usually these are implemented as a release of, of supervisory requirements or, or expectations. And um, yes, altogether, I think this, 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 this figure shows that a broad variety of um, instrument categories from which, um, from which financial supervisors have, have drawn their response. So very broad, broad approach, lots of instruments have been used. And um, yes, so yeah, Turning to the sustainability dimension, we have found the following. Um, in only one economy has, has the uh, central bank explicitly calibrated a crisis response instrument in a what we would call sustainability enhanced way. And this is the Reserve Bank of Fiji, which has raised its crisis response import substitution and export finance facility to provide credit to, to well, among others, renewable energy businesses at a concessional rate. And yeah, however, as, as the figure um, shows, central banks and supervisors in 40 economies, 20, 21% of the total, have taken steps to address sustainable finance or implement related policies in parallel. However, these are not directly related to, the, to, to crisis response measures. And with regard to regional trends, we found um, that central banks and supervisors in Europe and Asia have been most active in terms of introducing these parallel sustainability measures. And then, um, yeah, these, these measures have also been taken mostly by central banks and supervisors in, in high income countries. Um, so, yeah, generally with the toolbox, we want to provide a framework um, to allow for the, uh, for the categorization of a range of measures that central banks and financial supervisors can take to support a sustainable recovery from COVID-19. And at the same time to ensure um, that their crisis response measures do not have unintended consequences in terms of enhancing climate and, and, and other sustainability risks. And it will, of course, be important to further, um, yeah, for further research to explore in, in, in great technical detail um, how these instruments can be applied and in and, and the particular circumstances facing facing different central banks. So this is something we will do next. However, we think that yeah, that the updated toolbox provides uh, a starting point for achieving the the integration of these sustainability factors into the crisis response policy frameworks. And we would like to yeah, we 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 picked four priority areas where we think action is particularly urgent. First, amending collateral frameworks to account for climate change related and other environmental risks. A lot of central banks have expanded their collateral frameworks, and it would be good to, to also take these risks into account. Then removing the carbon bias within corporate asset purchase programs and align refinancing operations with Paris agreement goals. Um, for example, the Bank of England's um, asset purchase program has been shown to be aligned with, I think, 3.5 degrees. So that would be an important step here. Uh, third, adjusting prudential measures to minimize climate risk and strengthen disclosure and stress testing requirements. And finally, adopting sustainable and responsible investment principles for portfolio management, including the policy portfolios of central banks. Um, yes, my last slide. Um, the next phase of the, of the crisis response. So in terms of next steps, we think that it would be important to bring together these, these two largely separated, uh, separate tracks of crisis response and sustainability commitment. First, well, regarding the easing and, and credit expansion policy, it would be important that sustainability considerations are incorporated to avoid a significant expansion of lending to economic sectors that are not aligned with transition plans. And under ambitious transition plans, this, this expansion could constitute a significant investment in essentially stranded assets. So this would be, this would be our main argument here. 
Um, then the widespread and undifferentiated, undifferentiated counter cyclical re release of regulation um, and supervisory expectations in face of significant transition and also physical risks is, is rather problematic. And we would argue that if prudential measures are released, assets and related exposure to, to sectors bearing the highest transition risks should be exempt from this release. And um, yes, then of course the NGFS, as well as a lot of national central banks and supervisors have made significant progress as we also just have seen um, in expanding their capacity and knowledge on climate change and related risks. And the implementation of all these measures that are being discussed should be brought forward and be applied to all these crisis response measures already. Uh, yes, finally, further dialogue and analysis is of course needed to explore how, how these well established approaches, such as, as, market neutral, as, as the market neutrality principle, can be updated in light of, of market failure, such as climate change, and we would also like to mention here biodiversity loss specifically. And with this, yes, I would like to hand back to Aziz and the discussants. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Simon, and thank you also, Nick. That's uh, an excellent presentation and some real um, strong areas where we can focus uh, the next steps and, and direct um, central banks to, to move towards. Now, I think um, in order to kind of comment on these ideas, it's very important to get a, a view from, from the private sector, because obviously these are the institutions that are going to be more directly affected. Uh, and uh, it's, it's uh, of course, very interesting to, uh, to us to hear the views uh, and also see how some of the measures they're, they're enacting. So uh, can I first invite uh, Harry Cho, who's the head of uh, sustainable finance, Asia Pacific at ING, um, to, to give us your comments on, on what you've just heard and perhaps talk a little bit about what, what you're doing at ING. Sure, thank you so much, Aziz. And thank you for really fantastic uh, presentation summarizing what I'm sure was thousands, if not tens of thousands of work, which is very, very important to move the needle in this part of the world and globally. So thank you so much. Um, just very quickly to touch upon some key points that really stood out in listening to the three um, presentations. Um, the fact that everything from here on, which has not necessarily been the case when it comes to risk analysis, is that we need to be forward looking. And whilst in the past, if in individual institutions wanted to forward look when, for example, it comes to probability of default models, as mentioned by Dr. Majun, the key crux and difficulty was the fact that there was no backward looking data that was required by central banks and regulators. And so um, I think we very much so welcome the fact that there is now this clear consensus that we must continue with the research to equip the institutions to do forward-looking analysis and to reflect the risk that we're facing, the regulators and central banks are also adopting this approach with time. Um, I think the fact that there is significant amount of progress, uh, whether it be standards or awareness in OECD countries, um, is, is an important point in that when it comes to the emerging markets, and certainly the case here in Asia, there aren't that many OECD country members um, in the Asia Pacific. So how do we actually narrow the gap between knowing um, where one may want to go, but the realities of uh, how it is on the ground. So to narrow the gap between the science-based targets and Paris alignment that we all need to head towards versus the reality today of balancing between social and economic progress. That is where significant amount of work is likely needed and where private sector can also step up in, help, in, in helping. Um, there was this mention of uh, how to ensure that there is a harmonization and proliferation and awareness. And um, one of the approaches that ING took from day one when it came to climate action and climate change was theory of change. So it's no good coming up with our own methodology. And we started a bit earlier with um, coming up with our own um, scenario planning as well as climate action methodologies from 2016. 
there's no point in doing it by ourselves. So we have open source whatever we had created so far in order to share it with broader number of institutions. Uh, we in particular worked a lot with two degree um, investing initiative to the II. And now the methodology that we had set for climate alignment again forward-looking climate action was uh, adopted by dozens of uh, financial institutions banks already so with that maybe i can just uh, share a few slides um let me see if i can share my screen Okay, so ING's approach to climate. So we, we, we look at both climate action and climate risk as two sides of the same coin. Um, climate risk, of course, is uh, taking on a risk assessment that addresses the impact of climate change on our business. And of course, our change, uh, the, the impact of uh, us on, um, uh, the, the impact that we are having on the companies that we finance as well, which leads to climate action. So um, how can we address the impact of our business on climate change? And that's where we had come up with certain uh, methodologies, working together with peers and um, leading think tanks and academia. The third point um, from practical commercial perspective is we must link these practices to transition financing opportunities. So I'll share a little bit on that. I had assumed that someone uh, earlier on would share this fantastic map from the uh, one of the NGFS reports that summarizes how the climate related risks actually transmits to the economic channels and that actually um, transmits onto actual financial risks. Now, this is, can't say for every single financial institutions, of course, some institutions are at a stage of really understanding even what climate risk is. But many institutions today have already understood this. And we're internalizing and operationalizing the fact that climate risk does transmit to financial risk. We have just published a um, couple of months ago our first climate risk report. And whilst we haven't published anything quantitative at this point, things are moving into quantitative analysis to see how do we embed this climate risk into, for example, the modeling that is required or alternatively other internal tools that we can use, for example, um, you know, for example, changes in the pricing that our internal treasury deploys for funding across the different parts of the world or um, uh, changings, uh, changes in the risk-weighted asset pricing and so on. So um, if you haven't seen this particular graph or the report where this came from, I, we would uh, highly recommend that. One of the things that was also mentioned, um, so again, I would like to just share what it had actually meant in practice for um, institutions such as uh, ourselves. Um, on the risk side, let me start with number one. The so risk side, um, we had started very early on looking at energy transition. What does this mean? And we realized that you can't really only look at the supply side, but you really have to analyze which of the sectors that we have most exposure to as well, where uh, who have the most usage of fossil fuels. And um, you know, for each of these sectors, it was our view that uh, we need to come up with some kind of a scenario planning, which is depicted on the left-hand side. Fortunately, even though this was actually created uh, before NGFS's excellent uh, reports came out, uh, we were very, very pleased to see that uh, um, the thought processes were very much so aligned. So utilizing this kind of framework, um, we had done further analysis to see for each of the key sectors where most transitions need to happen, including where we have our balance sheet exposure, setting the two boundaries, two extreme boundaries, looking at what is a fast forward green scenario. And we really hope things won't be any lower than business as usual. So setting that as um, the, the wait and see scenario essentially, and seeing what are the technological changes that need to happen and you know how does the funding pattern need to change over time so that can also direct us as to um, even though we're not private equity or venture investors, where can we foresee changes in probability of default as predominantly 
debt-based institution and how to then help our clients manage this risk as well. Um, so just final slide on the risk side. Um, the, the, the report that I mentioned, we have outlined what we've done so far on the physical risk side, as well as the transition risk side. As already mentioned, there is no industry standard out there on stress testing. Certain um, regulators have outlined, for example, Bank of England, as already mentioned. So um, we've utilized our own um, scenarios as previously mentioned. Um, the scope of coverage so far had been for transition risk. We are looking at it from global basis as um, each of these sectors uh, operate as well as our own business operates on an international basis. On the physical risk side, we commenced on the Dutch mortgage portfolio only, which may sound small, but us being a Dutch institution, vast majority of our mortgage um, and real estate asset base actually is in the Netherlands. So um, understanding, for example, and we had teamed up with Swiss Re, um, who obviously the insurance providers would have uh, best data when it comes to physical risk as this is their bread and butter daily business and such collaborations would likely continue in the future. To understand um, physical risks as to if there is changes in rainfall or heat um, or, or water levels rise, what does it mean for different uh, um, parts of Holland? And um, whilst we have looked at this at postcode levels um, this year, the idea is to increasingly become granular over time, so it can be on a per house basis. On the transition heat, uh, heat map side, um, again, this will become more quantitative in our disclosure as well as uh, the work that we do internally over time, but uh, we have clearly identified also leveraging on the UNEP FIT CFD program, um, the, the work that's, that, that's been done, and we've also been part of that pilot. What are the um, sectors that we consider high risk, medium risk, and low risk? And to continue to build upon this based upon four key risk factors, namely direct and indirect emissions costs, low carbon capex, capex and revenue um, uh, deployment over time as well. Um, so I'm running just a little bit out, uh, out of time, but we just wanted to show you, we can't leave out the climate action side whenever we discuss climate risks. It's at the end of the day, you have to understand what are the risks and prevent that, but actually take even further action to proactively fund the changes we need to see. And this is where um, uh, our so-called climate action, uh, alignment dashboard comes in. So for nine of the um, heaviest carbon emission sectors on our balance sheet. We have utilized external data wherever possible, the, the, the best um, internationally accepted scientifically backed pathways as to where the globally the world needs to go on a per sector basis. Where is the market at based upon, for example, forward looking capex that's been announced by the various companies? And where is our portfolio at today? and um, you know, utilizing convergence methodology, where do we need to get to? And you know, one of the two of the key ways that we would actually look to take action is first of all, engage. Engage with the companies who are our clients in each of these sectors. But secondly, we will also make choices in where we allocate our capital as can be seen by um, already 2015 call announcement, no more call announcement we made and upstream oil and gas um, aligned to the SDS trajectory, which will be tightened over time as the SDS trajectory itself changes, i.e. our SDS trajectory. There will be decrease in how much we invest in upstream oil and gas. Um, so maybe I shall leave it there and maybe I can touch up on some of the transition finance topics in the Q&A. Okay, thank you very much, Harry. Um, can I invite uh, our next speaker, Grace Hui, who's the Managing Director, Head of Green and Sustainable Finance at HKX, just to give your views as well, please. Thank you, Asis. I would like to thank NGFS and Inspire for organizing this joint event. It is a privilege to be here to share my views with you all and also such distinguished panelists. I agree with Henry's comments earlier. Uh, so much work has gone into the research and publication of these two reports. Everyone who work in the finance sector will benefit from reading them. 
I certainly did. So thank you, NGFS Inspire, Dr. Ma, Simon and Nick. Um, Assis, I think, wanted me to introduce myself. So I am Grace Hoy. I'm from the um, Hong Kong Stock Exchange in the uh, uh, managing the green and sustainable finance area. Um, so I'm here to share with you um, our exchange overall ESG journey um, from both as a market regulator and market operator perspective. So having heard the insightful presentations, my overall takeaway is that the financial sector, including the central banks, supervisors and regulators, are making good progress in greening the financial system. However, there's still a lot more we all need to do if we were to effectively manage climate risks and mobilize capital to support the transition to a sustainable economy. In both presentations, we heard about the options for mainstreaming environmental risk analysis, ERA, and also priority areas for integrating sustainability factors. These areas all required an in-depth understanding of environmental risks, including environmental related risks, such as credit, legal, market and operational risks, and climate related risks, such as damage caused by extreme weather events, and how environmental and climatic sources of financial risks can be mapped to physical risks and transition risks. I wonder how many of us in the financial sector fully understand these risks and be able to identify and manage these risks. But should that be an excuse not to do enhance awareness of the need for ERA, an excuse not to require mandatory disclosure of climate risks in line with TCFD? Similar to the excuses we have been hearing for a number of years now for not fully integrating ESG risks in our policy decisions because there's no unified taxonomy. The answer is clearly no. I remembered when we first made ESG reporting mandatory for all Hong Kong listed companies at the Hong Kong Exchange back in 2015, when voluntary reporting was not working. We received a lot of criticisms as the markets claimed that there were not enough expert knowledge, not enough guidance materials, not enough tools, and there's no uniform standard. We went ahead anyway. But we did it with a comprehensive ESG resources website to accompany the new mandatory requirement, including online tools such as carbon footprint calculators and the step-by-step -step guide on how to do the reporting. Five years on, all listed companies continue to publish ESG reports and the disclosure is improving. We believe it is important that we continue to collaborate with listed companies to help them improve their ESG practices through education and insight. We continue to provide new online tools, online seminars and guidance materials to help directors better understand materiality assessment, target setting and reporting boundaries. This year, we elevated the ESG debate to board level by requiring them to incorporate ESG into their business strategies, assess risks and opportunities and explain their approach on material ESG related issues to their stakeholders. This is a major step forward because listed companies now have to treat ESG reporting as more than a tick the box exercise. It encourages companies to incorporate ESGs and opportunities into their overall corporate strategies. I therefore completely agree with the options for mainstreaming ERA mentioned by Dr. Ma, including developing analytical capacity and databases and encouraging disclosures of environmental risk exposures. There are many ERA tools that industry associations, the central banks and academic institutions, etc., could help develop and put online for easy access, as well as ERA related training that these institutions can provide online. In turn, this can also help raise awareness of the need for ELA. Secondly, encouraging disclosures of environmental risk exposures in line with TCFD recommendations is also essential. At HKEX, we have recently required all listed companies to disclose 
significant climate related issues which have impacted and may impact the issuers. We regard this as an important step forward in corporate reporting, an area which an exchange like the Hong Kong Stock Exchange can push forward and continue to enhance. With continuous enhancement of ESG disclosure requirements, we believe it can help facilitate risk assessment for collateral frameworks mentioned by Simon and Nick earlier. To further enhance ESG disclosures and bring together issuers and investors to drive the development of sustainable market-based solutions. Early this month, HKEX has launched Asia's first sustainable and green exchange stage as a next generation ESG platform, providing both issuers and investors with an information portal with increased transparency and guidance on green and sustainable finance as impact investing is gaining momentum in global capital markets. On stage, you will find an online repository covering green, social and sustainable bonds, which the issuers provide information such as post issues report, like the use of proceeds and environmental and societal impact of the um, investments. We believe this transparency is important as it gives investors confidence and it also allows investors to make decisions on whether to uh, invest in these products. Stage is also an online repository of green and sustainable finance resources, promoting market education, knowledge sharing and stakeholder engagement in sustainable finance. We provide online resources such as case studies, webcast videos, research papers, and other publications aim to help, make, um, help market participants enrich their understanding of sustainable finance, ESG integration, and sustainable investing. In the long run, we will work with stakeholders such as NGFS and Inspire to bring more sustainable investment services to facilitate ESG investment and ESG integration in this region. On that, Back to you, Assis. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Grace. Um, it's very interesting to hear some of the actions that you're taking at uh, HKEX and uh, also to Harry uh, in talking about um, what's happening at uh, ING. So I'd now like to move on to the panel session part of this uh, webinar. Um, and I'd like to invite the audience to submit your questions that you may have for the panel. So can I invite uh, Harry, Uli, uh, Dr. Ma, um, to, to switch on their webcams uh, and, and um, we, we can start the discussion. Uh, I think it won't be possible for um, participants to, to ask their questions in person on this platform. So please use the Q&A box below uh, and send your questions through uh, and, and we'll deal with them as we go. Um, we, we should have enough time to, uh, to get around to all of them. Okay, so perhaps just to start off the, the discussion, um, Dr. Ma, you were talking about the, the issue of taxonomy and uh, some of the work NGFS is doing around that. Um, I think this is going to be a, a bit of a challenge. And although we see, for example, you know, the ECB is preparing their own, the World Bank has been working on it, and of course, individual countries, uh, particularly in Asia, are also working on it, um, there are going to be differences uh, in, 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 uh, in the different definitions that different countries want countries want depending on their industries and, and, and what they're trying to do. So do you see that, uh, do you see this, uh, you know, a way that this can be resolved or do you think it's going to um, continue being uh, somewhat of an issue for the next five years or so? Thanks Aziz. I think on the taxonomy issue, uh, if I remember correctly, Grace mentioned uh, that uh, the lack of taxonomy, lack of harmonized taxonomy is not excuse for you know, doing nothing. Uh, I fully agree. Um, in fact, uh, there are a lot of taxonomies available already. Uh, in fact, it's been evolving very rapidly back uh, five, six years ago uh, when I was uh, uh, co-chairing the uh, G20 Green Finance Study Group, a uh, lot of discussions on lack of taxonomy. There are only a couple of taxonomies. And uh, recently, uh, when I was part of the ISO, International Standard Organization, TC322, uh, which is uh, the working group on taxonomy, discussing 
uh, this issue, uh, we began to hear complaint of too many taxonomies. Um, I heard there are 200 uh, green taxonomies available, uh, which are developed either by governments or regulators or financial institutions or third party uh, organizations or associations and so on. Uh, so there are taxonomies available. And therefore, any organization uh, which wants to do something related to uh, using taxonomy, they can pick one of these, right? So there's no excuse of doing nothing. And uh, I think acting now uh, uh, is, is feasible uh, by picking one of the most suitable existing taxonomies. Of course, too many taxonomy will pose problems, uh, for example, uh, lack of comparability of the results, uh, lack of transparency, and uh, maybe someone would, um, you know, use a lower standard, uh, you know, out of many to uh, uh, engage in activity that seems to be greenwashing. So these are the issues arising from too many taxonomy, which mean that they, we need to make some efforts to harmonize uh, um, the various taxonomies. And these efforts are ongoing. Uh, just give you two examples. One is the International Platform for Sustainable Finance, uh, which was launched initially by EU and China joined um, together with, I think, a dozen other countries. And this network uh, has recently launched a working group on green or uh, sustainable finance taxonomy. Uh, which is co-chaired by China and EU, and I was uh, appointed as a China co-chair um, together with uh, Marcel Hug from uh, EU. Um, and uh, we just had a, a uh, uh, conference call uh, on the working group, uh, which uh, is now drafting a um, uh, sort of first version of the report towards a common ground taxonomy using China uh, green finance taxonomy and the European sustainable finance taxonomy as a basis. So uh, there's some hope that uh, between the two uh, very large green finance markets, uh, which are China and the EU, uh, we could reach some consensus on common ground taxonomy in a not very distant future. And with that, uh, uh, I'm hopeful that the Chinese issuers will be able to issue green bonds in Europe using the common ground taxonomy and European issuers will be using the same common ground taxonomy to issue green bonds in China. And other markets, for example, Hong Kong, could consider this as a reference for uh, their adoption or as a, the basis for designing its own taxonomy if they don't want to you know, build it from scratch. Um, the other effort to which it ISO, I mentioned earlier, uh, is a consortium of many more countries. I think more than 30 countries were involved in this TC322 of ISO, uh, which began to look into harmonizing green finance or sustainable finance related standards, not just taxonomy, but the, uh, include taxonomy, verification, impact assessment, disclosure, engagement, There's so many different standards across many, many different products. So I was joking on the TC322 that we may need a 25 standards uh, related to sustainable finance. And ISO TC322 could serve the function of a bookshelf for such standards going forward. Okay, thank you, Dr. Mai. So certainly uh, uh, encouraging to hear that, and and and, and you know we, we can just hope that that, that progresses as planned, uh, because I think you're right. There is the uh, the, the risk of greenwashing if, if there's too many different standards and so on. Um, the, the the second point I wanted to raise, and, and perhaps uh, I can bring in Uli um, on this, but it's it's also from from Nick's presentation. So Nick, please also free feel feel free to comment. Um, you know, Nick, you were saying we've kind of hit that peak oil period and certainly the responses from uh, seeing how COVID is spreading uh, uh, is kind of giving a, a lot more incentive for central banks to think about, um, you know, climate risk and how it's directly impacting us and, and, and to really push us in that direction. But perhaps maybe playing devil's advocate, given the, the recession that is now on us, um, there might be kind of the, 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 the opposite pressure, particularly next year, um, once we start getting past the worst of the pandemic, uh, as people, you know, uh, start getting out again, spending money, wanting to fly, using airlines, um, but also governments trying to create jobs and so on, that we might go the other way. Uh, we're already seeing the copper price shooting up and commodities going up in, 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 in building up this growth. Could, could, could there be a risk that we might overshoot uh, and, and uh, go the uh, kind of the other way in trying to uh, promote growth and leave the, the green uh, side of things behind in, in the short term. Maybe I'll jump in then, Uli, your, your thoughts. I, I mean, I think that we, 
this is a profound shock and crisis we're in. And I think if we look back, and Dr. Mao, you probably have some thoughts as well, that actually the green and sustainable finance agenda has moved forward through crisis. Um, so the GFC, the global financial crisis, led to a major, major shift forward and the COVID crisis, will, we will not go back. Um, and I think certainly there's a recognition and a real shift, we're at a real pivot point, that the, the green net zero economy is actually the best and perhaps only way we're going to deliver uh, growth, development and jobs in, in the next decade. And this requires a really very, very substantial uplift in investment. This is going to be an investment led process. Just to touch on one thing, a report uh, in my country, the UK, which came out last week, uh, a report which I chaired, is that the capital investment in, in net zero needs to increase fivefold this decade. This is not a sort of smooth transition to net zero. This is a, a, a really rapid increase, fivefold increase this, this decade in all areas of, of the economy. Um, and what is important is that now this is seen as a way uh, of creating jobs, driving innovation, and a really different structure of the economy. It's going to be an investment-led uh, uh, structure. And I think uh, the, the estimates suggest that by 2035, actually the, this upfront investment you need, rapid upfront investment, is actually going to mean that uh, GDP growth is going to be higher because you're going to be switching fossil fuel imports. So for fossil fuel importing countries, India in the region, actually net zero growth is a fantastic bargain. Uh, so you have more domestic investment and and uh, and re and uh, less imports and, and fantastically reduced savings. So so my sense is these and and it's always good to to be challenged. But I think there's a profound shift, not least because so many countries are now committing to net zero and the decision from President Xi to make his commitment on behalf of China uh, and then uh, President-elect uh, Biden means that I think there's going to be very little place to hide uh, for investors. Um, I'll stop there. If I can just uh, maybe add to that, um, sure. recently, uh, and this is before China, Japan and South Korea came out with their net zero carbon commitments, uh, 2050 to 2060, hopefully um, the move for China would go from 2060 to 2050 as well. Um, but uh, the research that um, we had done, and this was done by our um, Think Research, ING Think Research Institute, was to um, analyze the COVID response from where the money was going in terms of response and what percentage of that are actually um, even remotely green. Um, and it's, this was also put against, um, so Yale University also has what's called Environmental Performance Index, which uh, shows how each uh, um, many of the countries around the world are doing in terms of uh, environmental performance. There was a bit of a trend in um, those who were higher up the environmental performance indicator who had higher percentage of green stimulus as, pa as part of the overall stimulus package that were being put forward in the coming years. Um, and, and you know a lot of the countries in Asia, still did have uh, uh, zero, if not very insignificant amount um, put towards anything that's remotely green. And so there is still a um, fair bit of work to be done, but indeed it is very, very encouraging. And um, at a more commercial level, we are starting to see this filter through in the investment choices that real economy companies are making and the request that's coming through in terms of the funding requests as well, that there would be this uh, increasing transition towards net zero carbon. Of course, not forgetting the, the, the just transition um, that would absolutely be required in, in, in the emerging markets context. Thank you. Uli, did you want to add anything? Yeah. Uh, first of all, uh, well, hello from me. I'm coming in a bit late now, but um, uh, I'd first like to say that uh, having worked with Marjun on uh, the uh, NGFS collection uh, of environmental risk analysis and, and with uh, Nick Robbins and Simon Dickow on the Inspire Toolbox, uh, I'm very happy that we could uh, bring these two together in one joint NGFS Inspire event. Um, so um, really glad everyone could make it. Um, 
So on, on your question, Aziz, I, I mean, there definitely is this risk that, that uh, and we've, we've seen that, uh, I think, at the start of the crisis when uh, everyone went into crisis mode and, and kind of uh, uh, used tried and uh, tested responses, which uh, were not really what we should have seen. So in fact, in the Inspire toolbox, um, on the second version that, that Simon and Nick uh, presented today, we could see that uh, the crisis responses um, were not really aligned by, by central banks and supervisors were not really aligned with, you know, the, the sustainability imperative that we really uh, should see. And um, I think uh, this is understandable because, you know, at the, at the height of the crisis in March, when the global financial system was about to implode, uh, I can see that that central bank supervisors had, had other things to worry about uh, than kind of sustainability uh, dimension. This was really very uh, short termistic firefighting, but we have uh, progressed. And, and I think uh, it's clear that this is, you know, not, not a crisis that, that, that is over uh, in a very short uh, period. So we need to, to have, again, this longer term perspective. And um, so what we've been arguing in, in the toolbox is indeed that uh, the crisis responses taken now uh, will have profound impact. And if we have all kinds of liquidity uh, enhancing measures that don't take sustainability into account, we are building up all kinds of additional risk that will uh, come back to haunt us later. So uh, I think there's a very strong uh, imperative also for the, the regulatory uh, side to really take these sustainability risks into account in, in the current actions. And uh, furthermore, I think not only um, has the, the pandemic shown the vulnerabilities of our economies and, and financial systems and, and kind of really uh, uh, should lead us to, to, to strengthen the systemic thinking uh, of, of our uh, policy actions, but we've also seen now um, really meaningful uh, commitments on the climate front. Um, so climate scientists have been very clear for, for long that we really need to, to get our act together, that there is a great sense of urgency. Uh, but now we have, uh, just over the span of a couple of months, uh, commitments from uh, the major leading economies, the EU, the UK, Japan, South Korea, uh, soon the US, um, have committed to uh, net zero emissions by 2050, China by 2060. Um, and this means that uh, if, if all of that is really happening, there's going to be a massive uh, uh, reorganization of our economy. So the transition risk uh, is real, you know, and, and, and uh, central banks and supervisors have a very clear responsibility to address the transition risk. And so I would argue uh, and I'm uh, sure that, that uh, most of you will, will agree with me that we really need, need to get our act together. There's a real urgency. Uh, and even though, um, uh, you know, there's a lot of things we don't know, there's also an awful lot we do know. Dr. Ma's presentation uh, has shown very nicely that we do now have the methodologies to analyze these risks. And of course, you know, this, these need to be refined. We need to have more granular data, better quality of data and all that. But in essence, we really have the tools uh, that we can employ now in uh, prudential regulation, also kind of integrating into monetary frameworks um, to really uh, get things going. And um, uh, uh, um, it was uh, Grace, uh, who mentioned uh, from the uh, Hong Kong example, um, voluntary disclosure is great, but it doesn't really work. You know, you have a few people who, who will uh, be brave and, and, and go forward. Um, the time has come to, to uh, have mandatory disclosure of uh, environmental or social risks across the board. I mean, obviously not for, for small uh, medium enterprises, but, but for all larger companies, for all listed companies, uh, for all financial institutions. Um, if we don't do that uh, now, uh, you know, we will carry on with these discussions about, oh, we need better data, we need, you know, we need to better analyze it, everything. And 
And this will just not, not, not be enough because we, we have less than a decade to really fix our economies uh, and address uh, the, the in, enormous climate risk. And of course, we also have uh, a biodiversity crisis and all that. Um, so, so there is really a great sense of urgency. Um, or, or we, we need to have this great sense of urgency really also in the uh, prudential uh, community in the financial sector. So yeah. the time for, for just uh, thinking about what we could be doing, I think is coming to an end. We really need to do uh, a lot of things now. Yeah, th thank you, Uli. And, and certainly, I, I mean, I, I agree with, uh, with the fact that things have fundamentally changed and, and the debate has changed. So we, we can't go back to where it was. Um, but I think you're right. We really need to keep that pressure up, particularly next year. Uh, and, and my main worry is, you know, we had a whole um, uh, portfolio of non-performing loans building up even before uh, COVID-19 hit. Uh, as a result of COVID-19, and particularly once all the forbearance measures uh, kind of roll off, I think that's only going to get worse. And that's where we'll see the real friction uh, in trying to do things. So uh, I think that's it's going to be critical to keep the pressure up. Uh, let me now take one of the questions that's uh, come in. And again, can I encourage all the participants, please do send your questions to the Q&A box. Um, so this one is from uh, Ramin Shretra, and he's basically asking, how can we incorporate uh, ERA and climate change in the stress testing of banks? Uh, and, and I guess, I mean, um, you know, the, the NGFS has already published uh, numerous scenarios around this and a number of central banks, uh, MAS, uh, DNB, the Bank of England, ECB, already have published various uh, reports on how to undertake stress testing and in fact, how it's going to work once they, once they formalize it. So there's a lot of material available, uh, but perhaps let me, let me turn to Grace first and um, uh, perhaps Grace, if, if you have any kind of views on, on how this should be incorporated and what you're seeing uh, in, in, the, in the companies you look at. Thank you. Um, I think uh, we we basically follow the TCFD recommendations, right? Um, we we encourage companies to do you know stress testing and scenario analysis. Um, I, I, the, the the difficulty I think it remains that um, in in Hong Kong at least um, uh, there there are not enough experts. There are not enough people who understand how to do these stress testing, um, and we need to uh, consider how we can help these people. Um, because, you know, I, I was serious when I said, you know, how many people in the finance sector do actually understand these risks we've been discussing. Um, I can tell you that the, 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 the financial sector may be a bit better, but we have 2,500 listed companies um, and, you know, it goes from large COP to SMEs. And I can tell you the, 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 the knowledge gap is huge. Um, and, um, and we, we, we we can continue to promote uh, following TCFD, um, but I think we still need to give the tools um, to help them to report. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, def definitely a, a big gap there. And hopefully, once once the banks and financial institutions start implementing this, it'll force the businesses they lend to to also start uh, giving this data and looking into it because they'll need it to make their their credit decisions. Um, yeah. does it, does it, yeah, can I? Just jumping on this uh, topic, uh, uh, I think sure. uh, the first thing regulators should consider doing is uh, to require disclosure of uh, environmental and climate risk exposure by these financial institutions rather than scenario analysis and stress testing, uh, because exposure is a basis for considering the uh, forward-looking analysis. If they don't know the exposure, there's no way you can measure the uh, future financial risk arising from such exposure. So uh, I think uh, uh, that's relatively easy. Um, you basically ask, uh, you know, within a couple of years, these banks, asset managers should tell me uh, what percentage of assets are high carbon assets. And uh, by forcing them to calculate that number, uh, they automatically have the incentive to begin looking into what if under certain scenario, these exposure would translate into how much increasing MPL ratio, how much declining valuation, and so on and so forth. Uh, that's a, I think the first step uh, most regulators should consider. And second thing that regulators should do is to work out some sort of methodology demonstration projects by themselves. Um, for example, in Hong Kong, if HKMA can begin to do uh, a sort of a mock stress testing of a model bank and put it on the website, of that model uh, exercise, I think it will be uh, doing a lot for the industry. 
And the same thing uh, can happen to the you know, um, asset management industry. Uh, if the SFC uh, can consider doing a couple of model uh, sort of uh, 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 examples uh, for typical asset managers with exposure to high carbon assets and showing them these are a couple of methodologies which are commonly used already. And that will go a long way uh, in promoting adoption at the, uh, you know, in the local markets. Okay, thank you, Jirakumar. Mary, you, you were also going to share your views. I, I think it's already quite uh, well covered. So maybe we can move on, except just to highlight that there is bank specific group on the United Nations Environmental Programme for Financial Institutions for TCFD. It is already in pilot stage two. And there, there is quite specific explanations and discussions around how a bank can go about meeting this, including as Dr. Ma just mentioned, on understanding what your exposure is, what are the methodologies you can use, and you know how to even think about stress testing in the first place. And there is a plethora of um, uh, resources out there now to help you on this. Yeah, Uli. Uh, yeah, and just to follow up on that, um, um, I think we need mandatory disclosure, but we also, of course, need complementary. Um, support. Uh, we need capacity building uh, among uh, the regulators and, and, and central bankers, uh, but also, also, of course, in the in the financial sector. So, so this has to be a, a package. Um, and the aim basically has to be to 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 mainstream um, uh, this kind of analysis. So, so uh, that it's not you know just kind of niche, and we don't need a kind of a green bond market and, and kind of uh, that, that is a, a tiny fraction of the overall bond market or we don't need kind of a small fraction of, of green uh, uh, loans. We, we really need to mainstream uh, this across all financial decision making. Um, and that obviously requires capacity building, but, but um, uh, without having uh, some real push from, from supervisors, we can wait very long until this really happens, I think. Okay, thank you. Let me, let me go um, uh, back to the questions and uh, apologies. I think Nick had to had to leave us because he had another meeting, but uh, Simon, you, you're here, uh, no doubt will represent. Uh, um, so this question is from actually from a, a colleague of mine at CSUN, Glenn Tarski. He's just asking uh, about how do we deal with the free rider problem? Um, so if, if, you know, most of the central banks and supervisors are doing their part to incentivize their regulated firms to move out of brown financing, for example, then other authorities, perhaps in smaller countries, uh, possibly won't really have to do anything, but will still reap the benefits of less climate risk. And I guess that works the other way as well in that, um, you know, a lot of these uh, polluting industries are, are in other countries, but the effects of the pollution are, might be being felt in, in much smaller countries that can't do anything about it. So um, here I can see you're, you're raring to go and perhaps I'll uh, invite Simon afterwards as well to, to give some comments. Go ahead, Rudy. Yeah, well, great question. But so I think um, it, it's important, two things. Uh, first, um, uh, kind of historically, of course, you know, uh, climate change has been uh, caused by the large economies, the large advanced economies. So um, if, if we have small developing countries that were to free ride, um, I don't really have a big problem with that. So kind of from a climate justice perspective, um, uh, th that would be okay. And, and um, uh, I mean, of course, you don't want uh, uh, small advanced countries to free ride, but um, uh, so that's kind of the first part of the answer. The second is um, we are living in a, a global economy and um, uh, transition risks are not just domestic. So transition risks are not just about domestic policy making, they're also about uh, what's, what's happening in the rest of the world. So if you take the European Union, which is now getting very ambitious uh, regarding climate policy, take uh, the US, uh, uh, which, which also with the new administration uh, will have very ambitious climate goals. If they are moving ahead with an, an ambitious climate agenda, this will have repercussions for every country that wants to do business with them. And that's basically everyone. Or of course, if, if you have uh, the second largest economy in the world, China, which is also uh, 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 moving to, to net zero, um, you know, if you are a country that, that is exporting uh, uh, carbon intensive uh, stuff or that is uh, exporting coal, fossil fuels, 
well, you better watch out. You know, these are real risks that, that will, will affect you. And uh, if you're a supervisor in, in one of these countries, uh, you need to take notes. Yeah? So, so um, uh, these transition risks are real. And, and the physical risks, of course, uh, no, no border either. So um, every uh, financial supervisor in every country needs to, to look at what are the physical risks in my jurisdiction and, and make sure that, that um, these are taken into account in all lending and investment decisions. So uh, I, I think the free rider problem uh, is not a, a real one. Okay, thank you, Uli. Um, okay, Dr. Ma. I think there are many ways to deal with the free rider problem. Just give you two examples. Uh, one is from the international finance um, flow perspective, uh, because a lot of projects, especially large infrastructure projects are financed by international capital. If this international finance, the larger banks, asset managers are fully aware of ESG risk and they adopt uh, ESG principles, they will not finance high carbon projects anymore. So even if a country wants to do a high carbon project, it may not get um, you know, low cost financing to support them. That's one uh, sort of a mechanism. The other mechanism is green supply chain. Globally, there are increasingly uh, a large number of very large uh, companies uh, which are buying raw material and equipment and the inputs. Uh, they begin to adopt ESG principle or green supply chain principle, which means that they will only buy supplier uh, from uh, companies uh, which are ESG aligned. And uh, therefore, those smaller companies in certain countries which want to continue to do um, you know, a uh, 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 brown activities or brown production may not be able to sell their products to the uh, uh, larger companies. Thank you. And Simon, did you have anything to add? I think we've covered uh, quite a bit. But... Yes, maybe. <clears throat> may, yeah, I, I think Uli, Uli already answered this, this question about the free rider problem and, and, and Majun also very well. Um, maybe to respond to this question by Lionel and also the um, anonymous attendee, Sure. Yeah. So that. So the, yeah. So the question from from Lionel Mark at the Climate Bonds Initiative uh, is asking how do we navigate or respond to the social and economic priorities in ASEAN when trying to push to sustainable or trying to push the sustainable recovery agenda? What are the key messages that we need to convey to the central banks? And the other question is then what contributes to uneven development of sustainable finance and how can we overcome that gap? So go ahead, Simon. Yeah, I <clears throat> I think these. These are very interesting because so what we found in, 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 in our paper is that a lot of central banks basically extended or introduced instruments um, that were formerly considered not necessarily appropriate or at, at least not part of the standard set of central banking instruments in some countries. Um, for example, a lot of central banks have introduced um, tools to support SMEs across the board. Um, through through supervisory release or through through monetary measures, and um, I think this is this is also very interesting for the for the ASEAN region because a lot of central banks are using these instruments, and I, I think it would be important to discuss whether some sustainability considerations could be could be added to them, and this can be absolutely country specific. So for for the People's Bank of China, um, we have discussed early on, I think in June with Ma Jun, um, when we launched the first crisis response about refinancing and green refinancing, whether this, this is something the People's Bank already does is my understanding and that could be expanded because it is an existing instrument. And the same is true for, for, for other countries where we see in the crisis response, okay, these central banks are, have these, these instruments in their portfolio, why not add sustainability considerations to this, to this new expansion? Yeah just to kickstart uh, an answer to these two questions. I'm sure other panelists have, have something to add here. Yeah, thank you, Simon. Uh, does anyone else want to give their thoughts? Yeah, yeah. Uh, please, let me add a couple of points. Uh, I think in emerging markets where we uh, see uh, less capacity for environmental risk analysis, I think uh, uh, the public goods aspect of ERA uh, need to be emphasized because a lot of methodologies, a lot of data, a lot of assumptions uh, actually do not need to be produced by, you know, uh, thousands of institutions or, 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 or hundreds of countries. Um, there are a lot of uh, common elements which can be developed by, uh, you know, uh, multinational uh, development banks, by industrial associations, 
by networks such as NGFS and so on and so forth. Uh, that's where um, you know, we, we can play a role uh, by making these methodologies and data assumption more like a public goods for emerging markets so that we can help reduce the cost of them adopting such methodology. And uh, the other thing is that uh, some emerging markets, uh, uh, countries policy, especially financial policies, uh, have not really assessed the green impact of their existing practices. For example, uh, I think Simon mentioned SME policies. A lot of SME policies which are helping financing the activities. But in fact, these activities may be uh, very polluting or uh, mm, uh, high carbon uh, in nature. And some of these uh, uh, financing incentives offered to emerging market, uh, for example, agriculture, were actually supporting activities that are using a lot of pesticides, uh, fertilizers, chemical fertilizers, so on, so forth, which is uh, leading to uh, you know, soil degradation. So this is because uh, there's a lack of assessment of the green or environmental impact of these existing policies and uh, some uh, capacity for uh, central bank supervisor regulated assessment in this regard, I think will be also needed. I may just add to that. Um, the way that when we speak to our clients, uh, for example, in Southeast Asia, or even uh, more developed nations is that uh, you need to future proof not only your business, but your fundraising. Um, in particular, the companies that have international trade flows, um, as uh, Dr. Mao also pointed out, they would, be, they would be companies, and in particular on the supply chain, you're going to see so many changes on what will and will not be accepted as good enough or green enough um, or, or too harmful. Um, on the, on the other side from fundraising and financing perspective, if, if companies do not buckle up and they actually look at uh, what are the requirements of their respective shareholders or bondholders or um, you know, financiers who are also subjected to rising tide in sustainable development, then at some point they will misprice the risk of running their business in certain parts of the world. And so specifically for the purposes of future proving the business, there is, I believe, a misconception that you either can pursue an environmental agenda or pushing for social agenda. Um, and you know, they really can be brought together, they are one. On the one hand, if they don't address and future proof their business and fundraising, they will face higher costs inevitably um, and lower demand for the goods that they produce. So all of these has to be taken into holistic balance and made, uh, you know, it has to be understood by the companies and, you know, the regulators and governments have a role to play in uh, using both hard regulation and, um, you know, even incentives or, um, you know, helping companies and corporates and um, the, the stakeholders and the broader society understand this point. So, you know, what is the real gap that we see in developing of sustainable finance um, is, uh, you know, every day we're out there educating as much as we can on what it means to future-proof your business. And some financiers, some companies, uh, some CEOs, they get it, some don't. Um, those who are more exposed to international fundraising, for example, from financing perspective, get it. The investors are knocking on their door, say, where's your disclosure? What are you doing? I was recently speaking to a company in uh, metals and mining space who are doing amazing things. And they're, they've moved the very hot, heavy energy kind of the production chain from pretty much very heavy coal or fossil fueled uh, power base to already 20% moving to renewable power and they intend to move 50%, but they haven't heard of TCFD because they're a private entity. So, um, you know, these are the kind of cases that we encounter in real life. And, you know, there, there somehow needs to be continued role that each of us play around the table to narrow this understanding and to help future proof the businesses um, uh, that, that we need to move. Okay, thank I'd you, like Harry. to comment on that, uh, if that's okay, uh, Harry. Um, I, I absolutely agree with you. Uh, the difficulty for me, at, at least from, from Hong Kong perspective, um, is that um, the investors are still 
asking for where is the alpha, you know, what's the return, you know, because they're all in there right, for a very short term, uh, you know, rather than a long term investment is like short term. So, so they're, you know, whilst they, they, they have investment policies that drive into, you know, sustainable investing, but um, they are not really in um, sustainable investing because they do the very simple ones, you know, exclusion, exclude tobacco companies, exclude, you know, fossil fuel companies. But, you know, how do we actually really get investors to care um, so that uh, the cost of capital for these uh, issues are really going to be expensive? Yeah, yeah, thanks, Grace. I mean, I, I think that, that's a key point because uh, the, there is that pressure from investors. And I think that's one of the roles of the central banks and the financial authorities is to is to change those dynamics to um, to 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 make things more expensive if, if they're going the other way and, and maybe that's well, I'll come to that in a minute but Ulia did I think you wanted to share your thoughts uh, as well I, I I actually also wanted to to endorse was was what what Harry said and um, it's really important I think to 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 emphasize that uh, kind of from a from a macro perspective. Um, there is no trade-off between sustainability and, and, and development, or uh, also long-term development in particular. Um, and um, uh, so this notion that, you know, kind of, if, if we focus too much on, on the green dimension now, you know, this will, will inhibit uh, recovery, this will inhibit growth, this is really the wrong take. And, and um, people, if, if they haven't seen uh, the IMF's uh, October uh, World Economic Outlook report, uh, I can really recommend there, the nice chapter that shows how uh, investing in a green recovery can generate uh, higher short-term returns, uh, higher employment, uh, but also uh, at, at, at lower cost and, and also in the long term. Um, so it, it is actually good economic policy making. Um, and obviously down on the ground at the micro level, there will be uh, winners and losers as always, but but I think uh, for public policy making, uh, there is a very strong rationale. Um, and uh, since the cost of capital was mentioned, um, uh, we, we have been able to show in, in research that um, uh, uh, companies in, in more climate vulnerable countries um, actually have to pay a higher cost of capital, which is also holding back business development and of course also uh, um, kind of then overall economic development of these countries. And it is really important to, to, to emphasize time and again that um, climate change is very unjust and, and uh, it disproportionately hits uh, the poorer or um, kind of uh, parts of society and of course also the, the poorer countries. So um, uh, addressing uh, climate risk is very uh, social and, and um, uh, so the, the discussions uh, we've had about uh, just transition where, where Nick Robbins has been one of the leading proponents uh, of, of that work are really important because we will not be able to um, uh, move ahead uh, with climate policies if we don't uh, support uh, those that are most vulnerable and most affected by the physical and transition impacts of climate change. Um, so we really need to get this, this right because otherwise we will uh, stumble. And, and I think um, uh, we increasingly need to um, uh, uh, have a greater role of the financial sector also in, in supporting this just transition. So um, actually last week we launched a new report that we did with the Alliance for Financial Inclusion about inclusive green finance where we emphasize the links between uh, climate vulnerability and, and kind of uh, the vulnerabilities of, of poorer people, um, at the same time, how finance can enable uh, this just transition by, by enabling people, uh, empowering people, creating new opportunities uh, for, for job creation and so on. Um, so I think that's a really important um, uh, uh, dimension. Thank you, Uli, and, and certainly that, that's a very good point in terms of, uh, you know, the, the, the evidence is, is quite clear on a, on a macro scale uh, about the importance of this. Um, but I guess coming back to kind of Grace, Grace's point, um, it, it's, it's those micro decisions, it's, it's the companies uh, looking at their individual balance sheets. And I think one of the problems in this area is the fundamental risk management framework, the Basel framework that we use um, has 
um, because it hasn't taken climate risk into account, it, it essentially gives um, a, a boost to fossil fuel industries because it's not charging correctly for that for that risk. So I, I wanted to kind of raise the issue of whether we we think that uh, there needs to be a fundamental change in that in that regulatory framework. And, and perhaps Dr. Ma, the, the People's Bank of China has been uh, one of the kind of uh, four leaders in this in, in terms of charging, you know, uh, green promoting uh, RWAs and brown penalizing factors when when uh, uh, looking at these kind of um, uh, exposures. So is that something um, that we think uh, central banks and regulators should be looking at and encouraging? And if so, there's obviously issues with that around arbitrage as well. How do we kind of deal with, with some of those concerns? Um, Dr. Mar, do you want, you want to kick off on that? Yeah. Um, well, it's a complex issue. Uh, this uh, issue of uh, um, introducing green supporting factor and brown penalizing factor uh, have been discussed, uh, I think, for nearly three years. Um, when the NGFS was started two years ago, it was a major topic uh, under the work stream which I chair, uh, which is called supervision work stream. And uh, in the first year, um, the members were talking about uh, do we have enough evidence to support uh, um, the perception that uh, green assets default less. Um, if that's the case, then many central banks believe that uh, we could consider uh, reducing risk of weights for green assets because uh, they were less risky. Uh, so it's consistent with uh, the uh, uh, principle of uh, improving financial stability using regulatory uh, policies such as uh, uh, changing risk weights. Now the question is, uh, um, uh, where do we have the data? Uh, are the data uh, you know, robust enough to support uh, the uh, conclusion? Uh, the only thing we found at that time was in China, we have the data for five years, uh, which show that the green loans indeed for much less than the, uh, uh, the rest of the, the loan portfolio in the banking system. Uh, at that time, the uh, green loans uh, NPL ratio was 0.4% versus 1.8% for the entire uh, banking sector's loan portfolio. So. Uh, that was one piece of evidence, but uh, the question then switched to, you know, what else? Uh, any other country have data? No, they don't have, largely because they don't have taxonomies. Uh, that's why uh, regulator didn't ask for the collection of such data. Without data, there's no proof. And even if you have a data to prove that historically green loans default less, then people will ask, uh, do these represent future trends? You're only talking about in the past, Right, green loans before that. Um, and uh, can you guarantee us that green loans default less in the future? You know, nobody can answer that. So uh, gradually, I think the debate uh, is becoming, uh, you know, collecting data from the individual financial institutions instead of at the country level, because most countries have no taxonomy, no systematically collected data. Um, but still, that discussion didn't go very far because most financial firms have not collected such data yet. Even if a few of them have the data, uh, the data points are too few to prove that. So that's uh, sort of the, the temporary uh, status of the discussion. It didn't go anywhere. But uh, I think there's one interesting new trend, which is financial institutions such as banks adopting lower risk weights for green and higher risk weights for brown, uh, brown assets by themselves, such as Natisis which did this, uh, I think, more than one year ago, and it was doing very well. Uh, we are learning from the thesis, and uh, some of the Chinese uh, banks are beginning to look into uh, these examples of maintaining overall risk weight or regulatory risk weights unchanged while um, introducing adjustment factors to green and brown internally uh, within the bank. Okay, yeah, thank you, Dr. Ma, and, and I guess, I mean, I think, yeah, on the, on the, maybe to rephrase the question slightly, it's, it's maybe not so much about green assets defaulting less and so on, um, because that's, as you say, we don't have the data and, and, and that may not be the key issue, but it's the fact that the brown assets are getting a kind of uh, extra boost because the, the external costs of those have not been incorporated in the risk decisions. And so um, the pricing should be much higher once we start taking that into account. And perhaps that's the angle um, that, that we may need to look at it. Uh, Uli, did, did you want to? Yeah, comment? I just posted in the in the chat. Um, uh, there's a, a Bank of England working paper from January which looks at uh, mortgage lending in the UK with micro data, and and they actually uh, find that um, uh, uh, energy kind of mortgages for energy efficient property 
uh, default less. So, so this is actually uh, some uh, supporting this notion that kind of green um, uh, lending in some cases may, may, may have um, uh, lower default rate. Um, but uh, otherwise, of course, there is very little evidence uh, for that. Um, okay, but but I, I would like to add that, that um, you know, kind of I, I think it's pretty clear that the risk in certain carbon intensive areas are very high. So, so that would, uh, I think, uh, warrant um, uh, uh, kind of penalizing factors for, for dirty uh, activity. So, so um, uh, the, the, the issue around green supporting factors, I think, is a bit more, more touchy. Thank you, Lee. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm perhaps just, yeah, just, just what, one point, Aziz. Um, it is yes, worth sir. highlighting um, in the EU, there is what's called infrastructure supporting factor now which um, was introduced last year as part, part of the capital requirement regulation. And it essentially is a broader set of regulation, but um, in, in order to get 25% risk weighted asset discount, one of the criteria is actually alignment to EU taxonomy. And infrastructure is defined fairly widely in this. So actually the European banks have been able to enjoy already by showing that uh, for the sectors that actually do fit as part of the infrastructure definition, um, that uh, there can be actually lower RWA, um, among other factors, by the fact that it is actually aligned to EU taxonomy. Um, and so that actually has been a boon. And we expect to see um, this as a test bed that may potentially widen the, the gap from regulatory perspective on pricing of the RWA as to what was uh, put in behind the uh, academic and uh, historic um, evidence on the causality rather than correlation. I'm not 100% certain, but this is something that is already a live case. And one quarter of RWA pricing is quite significant. Okay, thank you, Harry. Um, I'm, I'm aware of the time. Um, we're almost at the end of this session. So perhaps what I'll do is we've, we've got one final question. So maybe we can address that and give uh, each of the, the panelists a chance to give kind of their, their final comments. Um, but the question is around the issue of greenwashing uh, and to what extent uh, can investors be assured that corporations are taking real action and not just talk? And obviously that's that's a very key one. And I think, um, you know, as Dr. Ma was saying, first, we need to publish the data before we can even consider it. At least the first step is publishing the data. Then we can start to look at how bad it is and what actions have been taken. So that would be a first step. But uh, Grace, perhaps perhaps you can kick us off because I'm sure, you know, a lot of the companies, you said they're not publishing the data. Some are. How can we, we be sure they're actually acting on it and taking action? Um, and so for Hong Kong, all the listed companies have to publish an ESG report. So that's a good start. Um, however, the, uh, the data in the ESG report is not necessarily uh, being audited or assurance work being done to the numbers. So I think where we are doing it, we're, we're, we're driving the voluntary uh, assurance practice as well. Um, the more credible the data is, the more investors uh, will, will, will trust the data. And, and, and in terms of greenwashing, um, part of um, doing the stage, it, it, it is to encourage more additional disclosures uh, that are voluntary so that investors can see where the green uh, proceeds or the social proceeds have, have gone into which projects and the impact has been uh, um, uh, resulted from, 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 from such investments, uh, the impact, I meant environmental impact and societal impact. So all of this, you can see them from uh, on stage. This helped reduce the risk of greenwashing. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Simon, do you want to share kind of uh, your thoughts um, on that? Yes, yes. Just to support what what Dr. Ma has always has always said that um, I, I mean the importance of taxonomies is is is, is really is yeah we, we can't underestimate this here, and I I think the um, the European taxonomy also provides a nice example of how it was developed last year and how the ECB then managed to pick up on this and um, discuss whether its collectible framework could be aligned with this. Of course, this is all only on the <clears throat> on the green side, and it would be very helpful to also um, somehow classify um, those sectors that are most polluting and therefore have the highest transition risks. But um, 
yeah, important to, to also internationally look at the different taxonomies that have been developed and to find an alignment of these. I think this could be a crucial step to avoid greenwashing. Thank you. Uh, Harry, you you've, you've, uh, gave us quite a, quite a bit of detail on that infrastructure facility, but uh, anything else, any final thoughts you want to leave us with? Yeah, so I, I think um, obviously the bottom up disclosure is very important, but uh, investors and financiers are also looking at more systemic solutions. And so, for example, the Asset Owners Net Zero Carbon Alliance is one. It's a coalition of asset owners who have come together, and I believe that they would be publishing a paper soon on their take on how to actually look at calculating the um, alignment as well as the carbon footprint of companies, not only companies, but also potentially instruments as well, different types of instruments that public investors or non-public investments uh, investors may invest in. Um, so I would also add that there is significant uh, work that can be done at the investor levels for them to actually take their own assurance, if you'd like, on uh, um, you know, kind of third party checks on what the company discloses. Having said that, you cannot, you know, the information that is not there, you simply cannot digest further. So, um, you know, just really putting forward the, um, not only where is a company today, but the forward looking direction on, you know, what is their strategy to alignment to, for example, Paris Agreement or, um, and, and, you know, very much so also to focus on the social side. Um, you know, the, the sort of the disclosure part is just that I cannot emphasize enough how paramount it is for not only direct access to the information that gets disclosed, but further crunching of data by the investors themselves or by um, intermediaries such as uh, ESG rating companies um, or verification providers. So, um, yes. Okay, thank you, Harry. Uh, Dr. Ma, any final yes. thoughts? From as I said many times, I think there's three key uh, factors that determine the, uh, uh, the extent uh, to which greenwashing is possible. One is taxonomy. Uh, not only we need taxonomy for green sustainable finance activities, we also need taxonomy for uh, these dirty, uh, or we can call polluting and uh, high carbon activities. Uh, with high quality taxonomy, we can help avoid some of the greenwashing. What do we mean by high quality? It should be detailed enough. It shouldn't be, uh, a, it should not be a very broad, uh, very simple set of uh, a category. We need to have something uh, like a few hundred lines in the taxonomy so that the users will easily identify uh, which category my project will fall into. Um, the second thing is about disclosure. We need to move, as Grace said, gradually from uh, uh, voluntary to semi-voluntary and eventually to compulsory disclosure requirement so that we make, make sure that the information will be made available on ESG. And thirdly, we need to have some sort of verification um, in some areas, if it's pure green, uh, that's relatively easy, but in most areas, uh, whether it's actually green or not green is not very easy to, uh, to see. So uh, some expert verification, third party opinion uh, will be necessary uh, to ensure that the greenwashing is being controlled. Okay, thank you. And um, finally, we'll come to Dr. Uli. Thanks, uh, Aziz. Uh, well, um, I fully agree with, with, with what's been said uh, it basically has to be part of uh, financial accounting and reporting um, and, and uh, verification is really important. So uh, just like, like any other financial information, uh, uh, you know, should be verified. They should also apply to, to the green or non-green dimension. Um, and uh, again, I, I would like uh, to, to re reiterate my point that we need a very clear steer from financial authorities um, so the time is over where we can just hope for, for everyone to do the right thing. Uh, we need financial authorities to give very clear, not only guidance, I mean, they also need to give guidance, but they need to give very clear uh, um, uh, set of regulations, very clear expectations, how, how uh, sustainability risk should be managed and, and, and uh, with, with all the dimensions that were uh, reported. Um, and I'd like to thank everyone for really great discussion 
uh, and over to you, Aziz. Okay, thank you very much, Julie. I think uh, it's been a great discussion, and I think the the uh, overarching conclusion is is quite clear in that um, the 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 outcome from COVID certainly is pushing towards uh, a much more um, sustainable development, sustainable recovery, and uh, in central banks and monetary authorities dealing directly with climate risks, both on the monetary and uh, uh, prudential risk sides. But um, there's definitely uh, a lot of risk coming around the corner as we start to go into the more deeper recession and or depression uh, potentially, uh, and trying to get out of it, and, and hence there's an added onus uh, on on the central banks to actually make those um, decisions and, and changes to the risk management frameworks um, very clear. So I'd like to thank all the participants for for joining this discussion, for sharing your questions with us, and for staying uh, throughout this event. And of course, I'd like to thank uh, all our speakers, uh, Dr. Marjun, uh, Dr. Uli Voltz, uh, Simon Dekau, and uh, Nick Robbins. Uh, Harry Cho and uh, Grace Hui, thank you very much for, for your time. Um, and I'd also like to thank uh, Inspire um, as they've, uh, the fund, they've funded this uh, Sustainable Crisis Response Project, which is, which is behind this webinar. Uh, and I'd like to thank our, our research partners within that, uh, who are E3G, the SOA Center for Sustainable Finance, um, at the Bennett Institute for Public Policy at the University of Cambridge. So thank you all very much. I look forward to some, some positive actions coming out of this and to uh, continue this debate and, and, and make sure it reaches fruition. Thank you. And, and Thank thanks you all to the NGFS for co-hosting this with us. Thanks, Dr. Ma. Thank, Thank you, Dr. Ma. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.